Welcome, welcome to my Guild Wars 2 versus Final Fantasy 14. Two MMOs review. Uh, so what is this video? Well, I'm a long-term Guild Wars 2 fan. I'm a long-term Guild Wars fan. I've got roughly 30,000 hours, probably, across both games in the franchise, spanning many years back to 2007. But before even picking up a Guild Wars game, I had been playing the main series single player Final Fantasies for a lot longer. They're kind of a part of my childhood. And yet in all this time in the MMO space, I've never tried either of the Final Fantasy MMOs. The subscription fees put me off. That is until recently when I picked up FF14. Since hearing so much good about it this year, I've been playing the hell out of that MMO. And I'm at the point now where I can really see, I feel, the big differences between it and my, up to this point, main game, that being Guild Wars. So I wanted to talk about what I found. That's this review. I've seen several people these past few weeks flinch at this idea, a versus review between two products that are definitely aiming for different things. They have very different focus and feel. You might say it's apples to oranges, but not me. I see two fantasy RPGs delivering a linear narrative with MMO-oriented social features, class-based combat systems, similar release dates, and eerily similar supporting releases right through the 2010s to today. For example, when Guild Wars 2 got its first expansion, The Heart of Thorns, so did Final Fantasy get its first expansion, Heaven's Ward, just a few months earlier. And as Final Fantasy supported that expansion with patches, so did Guild Wars 2 release its Season 3 patches. They were going side by side. Path of Fire and the second Final Fantasy expansion, Stormblood, lined up likewise. That's already interesting to me, because my impression had been, before all of this, that Final Fantasy was way ahead. Guild Wars 2 was much slower at the X-Pax than its competitors, but not so. And I find the trajectory of the games even more interesting still. The two games are practically the reverse of each other, with Guild Wars 2 seeing an immensely successful launch and subsequent drop-off in gaming mainstream interest, while Final Fantasy XIV offered possibly the worst MMO launch I've ever seen. It had to relaunch with A Realm Reborn later, and ever since then has had a slow and steady rise. Obviously the fact that after Stormblood, Final Fantasy released the Shadowbringers expansion, one of the best reviewed MMO products I've ever seen, while Guild Wars 2 followed Path of Fire with no expansion at all, instead the Icebridge Saga, throws the games apart a huge amount as we look today. But I don't think that should kill a review like this, especially when Guild Wars 2 might get back on its feet with End of Dragons, with its eventual release and its subsequent patches. It's crazy to me to think that while I was playing a certain Guild Wars patch, there is something I can exactly know the Final Fantasy community was enjoying and how good it was and what it contained. So I'm doing the review. Now let's be blunt, they're MMOs, they're massive games. We could easily get trapped illustrating every detailed little difference in every comparable feature, but I kind of fell into that trap and realized I don't want to do that. It's tedious and futile really. In this video, I'm going to clearly illustrate the big differences. What is most impressive about Final Fantasy XIV for me coming over as a Guild Wars fan? Or what playing Final Fantasy XIV makes me realize Guild Wars 2 is so good at and what those fans would enjoy about that game. As always, I'm trying to be impartial. So let's be real about my bias. I mean, I already said it really. I'm a massive Final Fantasy fan. You can find I've got videos on my channel about it from dating back many years ago. I even have a project in the working right now, but I'm definitely a bigger Guild Wars fan. Not only that, and this is probably the most damning thing, I really view Guild Wars as the underdog in this comparison, in terms of popular opinion at the very least. And who doesn't love an underdog story coming out on top? So I'll try to keep those impulses in check. Let's start by making the case for Guild Wars 2. What are all the ways in which it's most impressive in this comparison? Definitely a better game than Final Fantasy XIV. Just to open with a quick sidebar here, this is a pretty long video and I mostly focused on the script. So for the first half where we're making the case for Guild Wars 2, I'm gonna put Guild Wars 2 footage in the background. For the second half, it'll be Final Fantasy footage in the background. Sorry, it's not more meticulously done, but there you have it. The first and possibly most obvious thing to most people is that Guild Wars 2 shines for its open world. Final Fantasy obviously does have an open world that you can explore. 
You'll travel through it to find dungeons, do side quests, unlock features, progress through the main scenario. But it always feels substantively more like a backdrop to your adventures than anything else. They sometimes have achievements there. There's a fate system, which is kind of a rough equivalent attempt at Guild Wars 2's dynamic events. But really, you can kind of tell that open world is not Square Enix's focus. Mobs just stand around, they're easy to ignore, and even if they aggro on you, they're easy to just run away from, particularly when mounted. And I feel like the whole place kind of has more of a mid-2000s MMO vibe, rather than something from the 2010s. Sometimes it can look pretty. There's a really sophisticated weather system that dramatically changes the appearance of the environments you go through. If you catch a place with nice, bright, clear sky daylight, you can really get some impressive vistas. And Square Enix are very good at drawing a far out distance. If you look to the edge of one of these maps, which are structured very much like the Guild Wars ones, there are lots of small places separated by loading screens. If you look beyond the boundaries, quite often Square Enix will present you a whole world out there that travels to the horizon, while Guild Wars 2 has all these awkward rectangular walls everywhere. But beyond being in awe of some pretty vistas, open world never really does anything for me in Final Fantasy. Guild Wars 2 feels like it has all of its focus there. Dynamic events don't have a clunky, synchronized opt-in system. They flow much better to get access to, regularly chain into other dynamic events and present flowing dynamic stories to you. And of course, sometimes are parts of meta events, which will naturally pull together loads of players from across a whole map in an eventual epic world boss style experience. Final Fantasy does have the odd hunt train or doing treasure maps, but in Guild Wars, you'll find a lot more massively open combat and experiences much more regularly. And as much as I've criticized them in the past, playing Final Fantasy XIV makes me realize the Guild Wars 2 world bosses are actually not that bad in terms of the kinds of attacks they throw at you, how dangerous they can be, how big they can end up getting, especially once we start looking at the expansions and how incredibly sophisticated and powerful the Heart of Thorns metas are. To compare something like Verdant Brink, Day or Night, or Tarir, or the Chuck Guerin in the Tangled Depths, or the Silver Wastes to anything that Final Fantasy has is a bit of a joke really. ArenaNet wins this hands down. It's not just events though, it's a lot more apparent what objectives there are to do in the open world and what you'll be rewarded for in Guild Wars 2. Like map completion is a big thing, you know you'll be going for points of interest and hero challenges and mastery points and vistas and renowned hearts despite all of their discredit by the Guild Wars 2 community actually do add another layer and another form of questing which is easy and natural to get used to and gives a sense of purpose and meaning to a lot of the towns and outposts and villages and things you'll explore around Tyria. Meanwhile in Final Fantasy, if you don't have a specific quest specifically associated with the place, it's really just going to look hollow and empty. There are more places to unfog in Guild Wars 2. There's more voice acting to be found on the NPCs that inhabit its world, like way more. Final Fantasy does almost no voice acting at all by comparison. That's not just true for the open world, but the game in general. There are more Easter eggs in Guild Wars 2. It's more rewarding to find something hidden, like the strawberry patch in vanilla outside of the Black Citadel, or the Golden Grove in the Caledon Forest, or countless other places that have been added and implemented since then. And there's frankly, better environment art. Aesthetics and visuals are something that's more up to taste all the time, and like I say, with the right lighting and the right views over long vistas and far draw distances, Final Fantasy can look good. It definitely looks better in the later expansions too, when they no longer had to support the PlayStation 3. But Guild Wars 2 consistently looks better, especially when you get into the expansions. I really view the complexity and verticality and sense of depth you get from Heart of Thorns maps as light years beyond anything Heavensward was able to do, though I admit the Cloudlands does have have its certain charm. I know some of you guys won't buy that argument, some people are really fanatical about how good Final Fantasy can look, but I'll throw this at you as well. Guild Wars 2 adds more maps, it has a bigger core world and through its living world seasons it continued to expand. As far as I can see, Final Fantasy didn't really do that, or it tried it for a bit and then decided that wasn't the right way to go. If you were playing Season 3 in Guild Wars 2, you were constantly getting new areas of Tyria to unlock and explore. Meanwhile, in Final Fantasy, you have to wait for expansions for that kind of thing. A second area Guild Wars 2 absolutely smashes Final Fantasy in is jumping puzzles. Now, don't get me wrong, Final Fantasy does have JPs, and I quite enjoy them. 
Final Fantasy has a very bad reputation of having clunky jumping. The reason for that is the game wasn't really designed for it, and your controls really lock you in. Once you commit to a jump, you can't really reposition or movement in midair. Sometimes it can be fiddly and aggravating just climbing on something as simple as a small box in Final Fantasy. But there is one side of that I really enjoy. You are having to commit to a jump. If you're doing a particular jumping puzzle at, say, Kugane in the Stormblood expansion, they'll ask you to jump away from an epic pagoda onto a tiny little wooden platform, and if you miss, it's all the way back down for you. In moments like that, Final Fantasy is able to give me real adrenaline, a drop in my stomach, and a fear that I might miss, something I don't really get from Guild Wars 2. But... Guild Wars 2 is clearly the better jumping puzzle game. It has cleaner controls for jumping puzzles. It has gliding since the expansions too, which can augment the experience a little bit. Since Path of Fire and the inclusion of mounts, it has lots of jumping puzzle-esque experiences using your mounts, just littered in and filtered throughout the game in ways you might not even consider as a formal puzzle anymore. Like for example, the stuff that goes on at the temple to get your sand jackal, and the places that unlock once you've got access to the jackal's portals. And let's talk about just raw jumping puzzles. There are tons of them, hidden all around the open world. Some of them with moving platforms, some of them with pads that turn on and off and you've got to press a button to make sure you get beyond in a certain time. ArenaNet were doing this stuff years ago. People don't really play it anymore, but think about how sophisticated and amazing the Obsidian Sanctum puzzle is in World vs. World, a giant open world 3v3 format where you can set traps off at people coming up behind you. They've continued to add jumping puzzle in more recent patches and for all different kinds of players too. You might look at the Chalice of Tears, a ludicrously by design frustrating and insane jumping puzzle and say these jumping puzzles are bad, they're not for me. But then, just a few patches later, they'll add the Siren's Landing jumping puzzle, which is a very different vibe and experience where you sort of gradually climb a massive tower and is not so technically difficult. Or there'll be puzzles even further to the extreme, like the one in the Silver Wastes, where it's a massive vast expanse where you're kind of just wondering where to go and your technical ability to jump doesn't even really matter that much. What about all the other side exploration achievements where you can figure out to throw a rock at a random gong which will open a secret room in the Caledon Forest? Or a tiny hole that you can drop down into another puzzle that you didn't even know was there? Guild Wars 2 is king in this area. There's a funny thing I'm about to compliment Guild Wars 2 for here that's kind of weird to hear myself say, because I had no idea Final Fantasy or any MMO could do so little of it. To me, it's a fundamental part of RPGs, incredibly important, and that's buildcraft. What do I mean by buildcraft? I mean the opportunity to customise and tweak how your character plays and what it does. Guild Wars 2, as I would say most decent RPGs, is full of buildcraft. Let's say I'm a warrior. I can customise the weapons my warrior is actually using. So I can play with two melee sets and be a pure frontline guy. I could give myself a rifle instead and a longbow and choose to be a ranged warrior. I can hybridise. I can opt into different utility skills that modify my playstyle further. I can change my gear attributes so that my longbow does lots of flat damage and big crits on certain abilities that scale well with power. Or I can choose to do condition damage and be kind of a, a dot type character using my longbow. I can add healing power and run a bunch of shouts to support my team in different ways to say just using banners all the time. I have customizability. That's not even to mention one of the headline features of expansions, elite specializations, which directly hooks into the build craft system. There are nine professions they can all play in this game and it's a huge part of what Guild Wars is and RPGs in general to me. Final Fantasy doesn't really do build craft at all. Final Fantasy, you just click a button to equip recommended gear and you get on that stack grind. The devs will essentially push a rotation onto you and you'll have very minor ways of customizing. Sure, I've heard trivia examples of how materia can be used to cast faster as a black mage so you can move out of AoEs a bit quicker depending on how confident you are. But in general, these two products are light years apart and it's by design. Final Fantasy gets a lot out of having so little build craft. You can really trust that everyone in your party has the right setup to do their job. The roles that their classes define and you can never budge from allows Final Fantasy to have a robust and quick matchmaking system. So I do see the benefits, but while playing that game I can't get over a certain itch, an itch I always feel in RPGs, and that Guild Wars 2 actually satisfies. If you like build craft and these are the two games you're thinking of, 
definitely don't go Final Fantasy. Speaking of Buildcraft, let's look at something quite related to it, and that's combat in general. Now this is a complicated thing to talk about, because depending on the scale of combat, whether you're in hardcore end game progression, you're a mid-core player, or someone much more casual, whether you're playing solo, in a small party, or in a massive zerg, what the combat does well in each game changes dramatically. So let me be clear here to not tick anyone off. Guild Wars 2 definitely has the better combat for pick up and play and standard experiences. Final Fantasy has a very slow, traditional feeling, hotkey based combat system that is mostly about cast bars. If the cast bar goes off and the target's in range, that skill will hit and the ver variety of pretty animation you see changes based on the profession you are. It has a very slow pull rate for the server, so you get weird clunky strange stuff like you'll walk forward, start casting something and it'll get interrupted because the server thought you were moving when you'd actually stopped. Or you you can actively abuse the slow server by slide casting and actually cheese a bit of movement out when you should really be standing still in kind of this floaty weird game that you can play. Final Fantasy's design generally revolves around a global cooldown system wherein you weave certain cooldowns into a very strict window as you just queue skills. One of the main things you have to think about in Final Fantasy is not messing up how you keep queuing your global cooldown. To me, None of that stuff is particularly fun or engaging. And most of the time, it just feels kind of clunky and floaty and off. Especially as someone who lives in Europe but plays on North American servers, the impact of just a little bit of lag on my end led me on a rabbit hole reading about add-ons just to get the combat to feel normal. And then what are we left with? Something that feels supremely outdated, or like Square Enix just doesn't want to spend that much money on server resources, so they built an entire combat system around their budgetary restrictions. Guild Wars 2 is incredibly fast, incredibly responsive. I'm not just talking about the dodge roll, which I actually think kind of throws Guild Wars 2's combat off. I'm talking about how much movement there is in Guild Wars 2, how many more varieties of CC and interrupt opportunities you have, how much more readily you can move enemies around with pushes and pulls and floats and sinks. Slide casting isn't a thing. Random interrupts because the server polled at the wrong time aren't a thing. Sure, you can feel a bit of lag, again, playing e living EU, but playing NA, but everything always feels tight. It's not a purely tab target experience, it's a hybrid action experience. Guild Wars 2's condition system is much more sophisticated and readily applied, and it's actually about connecting animations. In Final Fantasy XIV, if I play, say, PvP on a melee DPS like a monk, all I have to do is walk vaguely near someone, press a button, and you know that it will hit, that a damage will attach. In Guild Wars 2, if I want to land a backbreaker on a target in PvP, I actually have to hop forward with the backbreaker on the animation and actually strike them with it. If they sidestep or manage to get around me somehow, it will miss. If I'm running against them as a thief dagger auto attacking, I do little double strikes and each one is actually trying to connect. The combat feels more real. There's the combo field and finisher system, which when playing solo or through various metas, even in team scenarios, has been really important part of the game and Final Fantasy has no equivalent for. It just feels more fun and fast paced. That's before we even consider the buildcraft layer I already mentioned that takes it to another level. Now, let's put a pin in this conversation because there's a lot to say about the way Final Fantasy does things too, we'll get to very shortly. Next, I have a real quick and easy point to make. I mean, this doesn't even have to be more than a sentence. Guild Wars 2 has world PvP, the world versus world format, which, yes, over time could have done with a lot more updates and add a lot more support. Final Fantasy has no equivalent really at all. What's it got? Stormfront? 12v12v12? Come on. That's peanuts compared to what Guild Wars 2's got to offer. Nothing more to say there, really. If you're looking for that experience, only one game will give it to you. Let's talk about mounts. Final Fantasy has had mounts for a very, very long time. Final Fantasy XIV's mounts are pretty good. Like, there's a huge variety of different skins to choose from that all hold you and carry you around in unique and fun ways. And they drop in unique ways as well. They're not just sold on the Mog Station store. 
They're actually earned through different content, and that means if the content you're able to play is really difficult, unique, hard stuff, and it drops a mount, well, you're going to feel pretty goddamn special when that thing drops for you, and you get to use it. The Final Fantasy mounts are supported with interesting lore and quotes and a whole panel that gives you details about them. When you mount on them, they tend to have unique music that you could listen to, specifically associated maybe with the boss's theme that you collected the mount from, or whatever it is that you're riding. They'll do fun things like like, oh, collect all seven of these super challenging mounts to get a final ultimate reward. And all of that I appreciate. Guild Wars 2, on the other hand, didn't have mounts for many years. Then it released an expansion dedicated to the concept. The result is that Guild Wars 2 mounts are the best mounts in the industry, and Final Fantasy comes nowhere near to how great they feel. Guild Wars 2 mounts are all incredibly distinct from one another. They all traverse the environment and give you opportunities completely different to what the other ones do, with just a little bit of overlap in some places. They are dripping with quality of life and art and detail. The idle animations are gorgeous. The strength and the weight as you clomp around on them or as you try to turn them is all different depending on which one you're on and feels really good. In Final Fantasy XIV, like with most MMOs, mounts are just a bit of a movement speed buff. Guild Wars 2 constructed its every environment with them in mind, even building in mount puzzles. And you can get on and off of them with ease without having to clunkily stop and stand still and cast some ability to actually climb on the damn things. They have the mastery system which improves their capabilities. And Guild Wars 2's done some fun things with acquisition processes too, like how the best mount from Path of Fire was hidden and not even marked it was a secret players found at the end of the campaign to actually eventually get your griffin, which not only unlocked the griffin, but also a bunch of unique race courses and flight paths that take real skill and dexterity to beat and work through. Then again later through the living world they dropped the roller beetle in and added race courses and raceways back to the core game. And of course the sky scale which you raise from a hatchling as an egg, play games with it and throw toys with it to eventually build it up to a full fledged thing that you can fly on. And with the future expansions, they're continuing to add mounts. Final Fantasy currently has co-op mounts. Guild Wars 2 is doing its first one of those in its next expansion, as well as a combat mount. Just thinking of the difference of floating around on a chocobo versus doing like a griffin race course in Guild Wars 2 says it all to me really. I would honestly say for any MMO enthusiast, hell even RPG enthusiasts, to try Guild Wars 2 purely on the basis of trying that game's mounts and seeing how good things can be. Because I think it's criminally underrated. Most people have no idea what they're missing. I have just two more points to make for the case for Guild Wars 2 before we move on to the other game. And this first of them is something of a subjective one. Maybe a bit controversial, so I'll leave it here. But for me, I have to say I much prefer the Guild Wars 2 playable races. So Final Fantasy XIV has more playable races, and it's expanded on those options as expansions have released, something Guild Wars 2's never done. But when I look at Final Fantasy and I see the aura, or I see the Makote, or I see the Viera. It's just a woman with bunny ears, or a woman with cat ears, or a woman with dragon horns. It's just a person with a slight tweak. And I know some people love their bunny girls, and I know some people love their cat boys, but generally, I don't find them that inspired. Meanwhile, over in Guild Wars 2, I feel they're a lot more dramatic in their changes. Look at the two diminutive races, the Lalafell versus the Asura. Lalafell just look like little people. Asura have a completely different physiology, with their ellipsoid heads, their giant ears, their sharp shark teeth. Let's look at the Char, the beast race versus, say, the Hrothgar. A Hrothgar is a bipedal, kind of standing upright, furry guy. A Char is a really distinct beast that will run around on four legs and has a very different kind of body shape. The Silvari aren't just people with leaves on them and pointy ears, which is absolutely how I feel Final Fantasy would do a plant-based species. They go really far to feel like they are plant creatures. In fact, in early Guild Wars 2 development, when ArenaNet did basically just have pointy haired people with leaves on them, they went to the effort of completely redesigning the race so that they looked more alien and so that they fit that aesthetic better. Adding their bioluminescence glow and the barky tones among leaves and all the other things. Granted, the downside here is Guild Wars 2 probably has more armor clipping, 
probably has more issues when uh, gear sets are mapped from humans over into some of the more exotic looking races. And let's not ignore the fact that one of Guild Wars' five races, which is a small pool, are just the Norn, basically guilty of the crime I'm accusing Final Fantasy of. They're just big people. But overall, with all the other diversity, I feel Guild Wars 2 does really well. If Guild Wars 2 was going to add a dragon species as a playable race to the game, I could never imagine them doing something as simple as what Square Enix have done with the Aura. Again, just my opinion, take it or leave it. Finally, in the case for Guild Wars 2, I have something much more indisputable, a very simple fact. Guild Wars 2 has phenomenal server architecture. It's an often forgotten about thing as a Guild Wars 2 fan, but we never have downtime for patches, we never have queues, we never have maintenance periods at all really. The only time Guild Wars 2 goes down is when there's something seriously wrong. Meanwhile, I've had multiple experiences in my short tenure with Final Fantasy XIV already where I've heard about a whole region going down, or there's been maintenance or I've had to sit around in a long queue because streamers have started playing on my server. That's not a thing in Guild Wars. And Guild Wars has two regions, NA and EU. It's not split into further lots of other small data centers, which restrict the kind of people that I can play with. Generally, these impediments to my enjoyment aren't there. Even on expansion launches. The only area of Guild Wars 2 that really gets queues is its world versus world format, which is not the whole game. Worse, for Final Fantasy, I'm pretty sure they have a fake queuing system. Why is it every time I turn on the game, I'm between 10 to 30 people in queue, and it always ends at the exact same time? I was so curious about this, I googled it, and I saw I'm not the only one that genuinely believes they just put a little filler window there while they take a long time to log you in, and they hide it by suggesting there's a big player population, when in fact there was no queue at all. Okay, maybe I'm getting a bit conspiratorial on this one, but it's true, Guild Wars 2 doesn't have downtime, we can't ignore that. So, that's half an hour on Guild Wars 2, let's now make the case for Final Fantasy XIV. Let's return to the topic of combat. I already complimented Guild Wars 2's solo, pick up and play, action combat, which I feel is light years ahead of Final Fantasy XIV's older hotkey style. But now, let's look at the part of the combat that the more dedicated players will be enjoying and spending a lot of time on. That's the party-based, cooperative endgame stuff. This is where Final Fantasy XIV shines, and it's not even close. When Guild Wars 2 released, it took so many swipes at the MMO industry, it's unreal. And one of those things was the Holy Trinity. Tank, DPS, healers. Now, maybe you're of the opinion that the non-Trinity chaos of everyone stacking together in Zerka gear for dungeons during 2012 and 2013 was brilliant. Maybe you're of the opinion that the soft Trinity of Heart of Thorns forwards with dedicated healers and toughness fixation tanking is even more brilliant. But I think it's fair to say that for your average MMO user who wants a clearly defined role that they can understand fight to fight, Guild Wars 2 set up has been controversial at the very least. Unlike ArenaNet, Square Enix never bothered to ask any of the really big questions about MMOs. They saw the Trinity, they thought it worked, and they went for it. So that's what you get. I've been told that in earlier patches of the game, before I started playing, that there used to be a lot more intrigue and back and forth in the game of holding enmity, but as far as I could see from the combat balance, none of that really exists anymore. Everything works like clockwork. And what this allows the studio to do is make exceptionally detailed and intricate boss encounters. There is a real hardcore endgame here, with each encounter playing out like a puzzle in its own way, with unique positionals, telegraphs, tank swapping mechanisms, and more. Telegraphs can be a bit of a weird one, especially coming from Guild Wars 2. In that game, if an enemy is using a big attack, you need to avoid, move away from, or dodge the actual big attack. A telegraph is just warning you something's coming. Final Fantasy has this weird reverse situation where all that actually matters is the telegraph itself and you often have this strange moment where you dodge an orange rectangle on the ground and then blatantly walk back into some massive nuke animation but you're fine because all that really mattered was the orange telegraph. It's strange 
But once you acclimate to it, you realize that Final Fantasy's telegraphs are really precise, like pixel perfect, and you never feel betrayed like you were standing out of something and then you got hit by it anyway, which is a kind of frustrating mess that Guild Wars 2 messes up constantly. And Square Enix are really good at being consistent about the way in which you're punished for being hit by various tells. Like, sure, you'll get your HP chunk down, but you'll probably also get a debuff that's consistent and predictable that will mean you take further damage later and remind you, hey, you messed up something that you probably could have avoided. Most importantly of all, Final Fantasy manages to keep its tells and stuff so clean, it's actually at the point where it plays with in-fight cinematography in a fun and exciting way. Like, the Final Fantasy fights are gorgeous. When I beat the Heavensward expansion and I witnessed a boss attack where it took me into space as the Knights of the Round surrounded me, firing millions of abilities all over the place, I was absolutely mind blown. And Final Fantasy does this kind of stuff all the time. Meanwhile, Guild Wars can struggle to show you even the most basic elements of a fight. Like I often think of the Veil Guardian raid encounter, in which a really important mechanic is to not be hit by some blue goop that summons under your feet every now and then. Blue goop that was almost impossible for me to see through my first several hours of progression back during the Heart of Thorns betas. Now, I do want to make one thing quite clear. I don't think Guild Wars 2 raiding, or any of its hardcore endgame, let's consider Fractals that too, to actually be that bad. Guild Wars has a different problem which holds it back, a problem that Square Enix solved years ago and means that they can be more experimental and figure out what works quicker. And that's the fact that Final Fantasy XIV simply has more content. Like way, way, way more content calibrated for this kind of play. Guild Wars does its best with Fractals. It has eight dungeons, which it's essentially sunsetted. Over the past decade, it's barely got out a couple of raid encounters and a few new fractal islands. It's waffled on strikes, which came with the Icebrood Saga, where they weren't confident enough to put it into the main story, and dragon response missions weren't received well either. They've promised strikes will be coming back with End of Dragons, but only after the expansion itself comes out, and I think it's fair to say confidence is at an all-time low. By comparison, Final Fantasy XIV blows my damn mind. It's another world. Dungeons in that game might be simple and kind of boring to some, but I quite enjoy them. And there are like a hundred of them. Every patch they put out seems to add more. They have fun, unique environments. They get linked to the main story. They have trial encounters where the entire point of it is eight people dedicated to a single boss and usually ends up very cinematic, like I mentioned a second ago. There are raids too, but not just regular raids. They have alliance raids, which are kind of for fun, big 24-man instances. They have semi-random features like the Palace of the Dead or Heaven on High or Bosja. And then they have different modes, they have extreme modes and savages and ultimates, all tightly and intelligently glued together and kept valid by stuff like Wondrous Tales and the Roulette system, which means it's very easy to find people to play this stuff with. It's unbelievable. Finally, and it devastates me to realise this, given Guild Wars 2's fundamental principle of not adding stat grind so that all content is supposed to remain valid. But Final Fantasy XIV actually has better access to old endgame encounters too, because it has a sophisticated minimum eye level setting and echo options. What that means is I could go onto my stream a couple of months ago and set up a really challenging boss fight with proper combat balance not invalidated entirely by power creep from years ago. I can realistically expect to go back through Final Fantasy XIV and experience a lot of its content in a near untampered with state. Yet in Guild Wars 2, things like the original dungeons and even some of the early raids have become pitiful shadows of their former selves. I'm just trying to think of when the last time it was that I did an actual updraft Gorsible. The next big topic I have is a somewhat subjective one, but an important one to me as someone who enjoys story in games. I want to first talk about tone and authenticity of setting. I think this might be born from a rating difference between the two games, I'm not entirely sure. But when it comes to Eorzea vs Tyria, Final Fantasy XIV is much darker. When Guild Wars feels like it's being very careful to keep the kid gloves on. What do I mean by that? 
Well, in Eorzea, if it's called for, you'll hear people swear. They'll talk about whores and piss and shite. Christ, they love the word shite. There's actual gore and blood in Eorzea. Like, I think about the cutscene in which Estinian went to town on Nidhogg. It was incredible. They're not scared to talk about sex. Like, I don't know whether sex really even exists in Tyria. If you find a reference to something like that, it's very buried. Final Fantasy XIV is pretty happy to talk about brothels, about bastard children, forms of abuse, and so on. It's not that I have some perverse desire to see things be really messed up and horrible in my media, and I wouldn't want to give you guys the impression that Eorzea spends too much time on this stuff. It has its fair share of cute and fun and bright elements too. What I like about these things is that they lend authenticity to Eorzea as a real fleshed out world with highs and lows, where there is real suffering and things to become invested in. It's not that I love gore necessarily, but it's that when I watch one of my favourite characters characters literally have his arm chopped off in front of me, I feel much more invested and concerned for their fate. To be fair, Guild Wars isn't completely absence of this stuff. One of the main characters in the cast has a degenerative disease, but you're told about it, not really shown it. There was a moment where some other main characters were stuck in blighting fluid pods, but you never really saw any real consequences from it. I can't help but feel like Guild Wars 2's writing team doesn't get brave or real enough when the subject material they're delivering really should be asking them to. Like, here we are sieging the raised land of the dead, once lost to the ocean floor, in a fight for our freedom against a spreading zombie horde, and everything has kind of an upbeat, positive vibe about it, where everyone's just kind of having fun and on an adventure. I feel like if Square Enix had delivered the ore arc, we never would have had dynamic events with people joking around in them. Back to authenticity, one of the other things you'll find in Eorzea that is very consistent is a lot of very flowery, archaic language and mountains of jargon. I'm sort of mixed on that, and I do value that Guild Wars 2 avoids it. Most of Guild Wars 2's story is easy to interpret and is written well in a nice blunt way. Meanwhile, in Final Fantasy, every line I read from some characters, like Uriange, makes me want to pull my hair out. Guild Wars 2 does cutscenes very rarely, but I feel like when they properly go for them, like say the Joko cutscene in Season 4, they're really good. They get through dialogue at a faster pace and don't bog things down with really long, slow tracking shots and characters that slowly play out emotes before eventually moving on. When it comes to story overall though, there's a reason I'm discussing this in this section of the review as a case for Final Fantasy XIV, because overall, I do think that this game is the better thing to be invested in if you are a story enthusiast. And it's honestly not that I think the overall story Square Enix are trying to tell is better or anything. I don't think that Eorzea is necessarily, if you were to look at all the pieces on the board, a more captivating place than Tyria. Both the world of Eorzea with its primal threat and evil Garlemald Empire and Guild Wars 2 with its Elder Dragons are perfectly adequate places to become interested in. If anything, I might actually take points away from Eorzea because it kind of has that healthy Final Fantasy dose of crazy anime convoluted twisted nonsense that if you're not familiar with the franchise you might not quite gel with or enjoy. But here's the big difference. It's about story length and which studio emphasizes that story further. Guild Wars 2 goes for a blockbuster narrative approach, whereby we move very fast from some big event to another big event. There aren't huge amounts of long, slow cutscenes, there isn't huge amounts of reading, and very often an extremely high proportion of what story you experience is going to be voice acted. Final Fantasy XIV is the reverse. It goes for the slow burn. It's asking you to read novels worth of text to really get the most out of the story. And you'll be spending a lot of time acclimating to a much lower stakes, slower feel. Here's a great example for you all. Let's look at the story of both of the game's first expansions. We have Heart of Thorns and we have Heavensward. In Guild Wars 2, a story-focused player will witness a tiny band of adventurers meet a lost civilization and defeat an Elder Dragon, one of the most powerful entities in known existence, in a handful of hours. 
While in Final Fantasy XIV, you'll go through an insane amount of playtime, reading and reading and reading, to ultimately see the defeat of one political leader and accomplish very little else because whatever good you'd done earlier in the expansion is undone with the final cutscene and a surprise twist I guess I won't say for fear of spoilers for people. Another great comparison is the first patch following those two expansion stories. In Guild Wars 2, we have Bloodstone Fen. A whole new magical disaster is suddenly thrust upon us and we're dealing with that. While in Final Fantasy, we spend pretty much the entire time analyzing the state of Ishgard now that its Archbishop is gone and take a deep dive on human nature and how these people will cling to their old leadership and how you can't just change a nation overnight. Now, I want to be fair to Guild Wars, I think there's a very real case for pe more casual story enthusiasts who might prefer the blockbuster approach. But that's the thing, I'm not a casual enjoyer of Tyria. I really love that place and I want lots of content and a lot of stuff to dig into, and I don't get given it. When I look at Heart of Thorns and I see the dropped Nightmare Court story and I see the dropped Malik story and I see us rush off to Bloodstone Fen instead of dealing with the fallout of the events of the death of Morgamoth, I can't help but be bummed out and it's a consequence of the blockbuster approach. That sort of stuff just doesn't happen in Eorzea so I end up having more fun. It's not all sunshine and roses though. When I say it's a slow burn, I mean it's a really slow burn. One of the magic tricks I think Square Enix accomplished with Final Fantasy is that the launch content is so slow and so tedious that when they finally start telling story a little bit faster and a little bit quicker with less filler, people have been desperate for it and sing its praises probably higher than it otherwise should deserve. And let's be clear, the launch stuff in FF14 is a tough battle to get through. I honestly think that the personal story in Guild Wars 2, with its side-by-side -side cutscenes that I've spent so many years saying aren't that good, is a million times better than all that launch content in A Realm Reborn. I'm serious, I think that that's one of the most tedious gaming experiences I've ever suffered through. I spent hours trying to take in as much information as I could and find out what people loved, and still a lot of it went in one ear, out the other. I think you'll only really start clicking and enjoying Final Fantasy XIV's story as the expansions come along. Like you can feel it getting better, and when it finally gets there, it's really good. I find I can really trust this game's story. There's so much screen time for the characters that you really get to know and like them and appreciate them as individuals. And at any one particular moment, there really can be five, six, seven, eight dangling plot threads, eight big mysteries, eight things you're waiting for a payoff on, and completely trust that the studio knows what all of those plots are and they will be delivered at some point instead of just fizzling out. Something that's happened, I'm sad to say, many times with Guild Wars over the years, that just feels like it's always rushing and ends up doing a disservice to its subject material. Let's move on from story and look at another subjective thing some of you may well disagree with me on. There's a fundamental attribute of Guild Wars 2 that I've come to believe sort of holds it back, and that's that its gear and its class progression is very shallow. Now don't get me wrong, this is by design. It's very intended, and it may be exactly what you're looking for in an MMO. There are a lot of MMO players out there tired of not having their time respected and becoming uninterested in arbitrary stat grinds every expansion. Along comes Guild Wars 2 and says, hey, you can hit gear cap really quickly, you can hit level cap really quickly, we'll never invalidate your old stuff, you're safe with us. And that's all well and good. The drawback here though, is it's very easy to get lost for what to do in Guild Wars 2 unless the studio is currently in the process of making lots of content. Regular expansions, regular living world, fine, Guild Wars 2 will thrive. But if at any point that wobbles, which we've seen in the most recent few years it has done, it can be very difficult to continue being an active Guild Wars player. Like you'll love the game, you'll want to log in, but then once you get online, 
You quickly become unenthusiastic about playing because you're unsure what's meaningful to actually do. And you might not have much of a friends list anymore and you might not be in an active guild. And even if you do have an active guild, you can't quite tell what everyone's doing in it. It's been the biggest singular problem with Guild Wars 2 since it's come out. And it's clear the devs know about it. They've tried many times over the years to introduce new progression systems people will hopefully be interested in. Fractal progression, mastery progression, elite specialization unlock progression, guild progression, world versus world ranks, PvP ranks, achievement points, collections, and on and on. But how many of those systems really have landed? And when they do land, for how long do they last? I think for most people, the answer is they're not that interested in achievement points. They're not that interested in side quests that are delivered as AP. They can get their elite specializations really easy and are aggravated if it takes a long time. And all too soon, they'll hit a point where they can't answer the simple question, what am I aiming for? So they'll log out and hopefully wait until the next big expansion or release. Final Fantasy XIV is a totally uninspired game in this regard. Just as I mentioned with the Trinity discussion, they saw the way that MMOs worked and they stuck by it. This is a game that follows the MMO playbook to the letter. There's raising the level cap in expansions, there's gear grind that progresses throughout patches, and with big releases, they'll add new classes and things too, which serve as full new progression systems for you as well. For everyone listening to this video, you probably know how you feel about that. But I have to say, coming from Guild Wars, I'm loving this experience. I'm loving knowing easily what to do and feeling rewarded for it. I love that there are all these classes I can go for. I love right click inspecting people I meet on my adventures, seeing which of the classes they have and wondering whether maybe I should go for them. I love that even the gathering and the crafting classes are full classes with progression in this game, complete with skill unlocks and rotations. It blows my mind that when the next expansion comes out, not only will there be new classes to play, but all the old ones also will get a whole new tier of things to do, including the non-combat classes. Now, before I get too crazy enthusiastic about this point, I do want to be honest about one probable issue with my review here, and that's that I'm basically a new Final Fantasy player coming to the game many years down the line while I played Guild Wars 2 every single patch. What that means is I have a ton of content to play. I can't really know what it was like to be an active engaged veteran of both games at once throughout the years. Maybe both games did ultimately run out of stuff to do, but my gut says otherwise. Maybe look in the comments for a perspective here that I just can't give. I touched on something a second ago, which is my next big point, and that was achievements. So here's another thing that Guild Wars 2 is kind of missing, and Final Fantasy XIV does very well. And again, it's because ArenaNet wanted to step away from the standard format. That side quests, a quest log in general. Guild Wars 2 doesn't have one, so it can't really tell stories outside of the immediate area of a renowned heart or of a dynamic event as maybe it spreads through a map in a meta. But it can't do big things, it can't do world spanning things, it can't do things that take a long time because there is no log to track actual side stories. Final Fantasy XIV has that stuff in spades. So there are the small side quests which are just dotted about all over the place. Those are largely ignorable. They give you basically no experience, no gill, no recognition for having done them. It kind of blows my mind that they're still in the game. They're mostly filler nonsense. But what I'm talking about are the big quest chains. There are full storylines associated with all the combat professions and the gathering professions. They don't just dump raid stories in nakedly as the encounters. There's full plot lines that go along with them. And there's full plot lines that go along with the alliance raids too. And hey, here's some fun full side stories following a kooky detective around the world called Hildebrand. Because why not? There's a panel in Final Fantasy XIV called New Game Plus, which lets you replay all their big storylines. And just looking at all the boxes listed out there, realizing that Guild Wars 2 essentially just has a main quest and none of the other stuff, is very eye-opening on just how much extra content Final Fantasy XIV got because it decided to do a real quest log. 
and the punches keep coming. Final Fantasy XIV's feature diversity is off the charts. And here I'm talking about everything that isn't endgame content, which we already did. Guild Wars 2 has a good range of features, sure. The hero panel here these days is stuffed with things that usually hooks into the gem store. So we have chairs in Guild Wars, and we have mount skins, and we have toys, and we have outfits, and we have the die system, which is very good and much better than the Final Fantasy XIV die system. We have finishers, we have mail carriers, they're a bit fringe, but they're there. And let's not forget there are adventures in Guild Wars, which can be pretty diverse, even if not many people are playing them anymore. Likewise activities like Keg Brawl or South Sun Survival or Snowball Fights during Winter's Day can also be fun diversions as long as people are playing them. And of course let's not forget that Guild Wars has its own great crafting system. I genuinely think that if they leveraged the Discovery crafting panel just a bit more and were a little bit more clever about recipe access and rewards, I think it would be a shining star of a system for the game. I really don't want to put Guild Wars 2 down. It has a strong showing. But then we come to Final Fantasy XIV, and I don't know what to say really. I just can't believe they found the time to put all the stuff that they've got in there. Take the act of gathering in the world. Guild Wars 2 has buy mining equipment from a vendor, or infinite stuff from the gem store, and then press F on node. That's their setup. I'm not sure I can really call it a feature in Guild Wars. Final Fantasy XIV has the act of mining expanded, as I mentioned, to a full class with skills. It'll have a storyline. It has a mini game that, yes, got removed, but then re-implemented elsewhere. Guild Wars 2 is getting fishing next expansion, hooray! But Final Fantasy XIV had it for years. It's an insanely expanded function of the game, with a huge log with lore for each fish and records of the size of the fish you got, different fish based on weather and time of day, multiple different fishing spots that will be tracked and recorded across the entire world. Oh, and a whole other gathering profession around plants, which Guild Wars has mentioned no interest in ever. The Gold Saucer is a Final Fantasy XIV hub city area, absolutely filled with an insane variety of content. There are jumping puzzles, vending machine minigames, lottery tickets, scratch cards, fashion contests, a battle royale survival platform game, a real-time strategy game based on your mini pets, chocobo racing and breeding. Fully simulated real life Mahjong, which is supposedly so well implemented that people will install Final Fantasy XIV just to play that. There's a roller coaster first person shooter experience, and Christ knows what else. Realistically, I'm still a noob. Unlike Guild Wars 2's adventures and activities and its festival PvP, in Final Fantasy, the Gold Saucer keeps all of that stuff together in one place and it's integrated very smartly, making all of it a super popular feature you can regularly interact with. The Gold Saucer also introduces Triple Triad, the card game from FF8, which you can then take out into the rest of Eorzea and fight with NPCs who have unique decks and rule sets and so on. And the regular game is utterly flush with extra features too. Now to be fair, they're not all in perfect working order. Just like with Guild Wars, I'd say both MMOs are equally as bad when it comes to being dotted with random half-baked or old features no one cares about anymore. Like the whole Lev Quest system and the Battlecrafts which aren't done in recent expansions. It's essentially a randomly generating daily resetting quest system, which I'm told 1.0 was really big on back in the day. You can actually see the first trailer for Final Fantasy XIV shows it in CGI glory. But but then they kind of moved away from. There's a whole system to do with ranking through your grand company, which isn't quite finished. In Guild Wars 2, you get to pick one of the three orders and then that's it. Final Fantasy XIV allows you to actually build rep a bit with those factions. There's a bunch of weird sub features within that, but it's mostly irrelevant. Like, does it matter that I can put in a ton of work to get slightly faster mount speeds in maps where I could be flying through them at top speed anyway? I don't think so. So I'm not sure which game really wins from this perspective. I could go on, really, about a lot more features in Final Fantasy, but I'm not going to because I'm about to make a very similar but distinct point of comparison next. That point is that Final Fantasy XIV's feature depth is just insane. Take the chocobo system, in which you can find a chocobo, learn to ride with it. You can also fight with it, 
You can train it in three distinct skill lines and assign it skill points. The method of training it changes a bit after it hits level 10 where you have to start feeding it a specific food. You can equip it with gear, a headpiece or a chest piece and legs. You can stable it. You can clean the stables with a magic broom. You can train it further there. You can feed it food so that it will change color at the stable. While feeding it food, you get a special animation in which you actually see it eat from this thing on the ground. When it does change color after you log in after several hours, you'll get me presented with a mini cutscene like a Pokemon evolving. Every feature is like this. Take a simple system like mini pets. Guild Wars 2 has good, robust, clear UI to get a mini pet out. That's about it. In this game, there are little animations for when they spawn or despawn. Each one has lore on the item tooltip, then when you unlock it, you have a full collection UI with a different kind of lore, and special quote on mouse over, and a little bit of concept art that you can look at. Mini pets have different behaviours, and will respond to your emotes differently based on that behaviour. Mini pets can react to other mini pets and do things like dance together. Some mini pets can actually interact physically with your character by like climbing on your shoulder for example, or if you're a Lalafell, they'll climb on your hat instead. That's not to mention how they can then be used in the real-time strategy game at the Gold Saucer, which I mentioned before, and would go into more detail about, but the game looks so big and so complicated, I basically played the tutorial and resigned to come back to it later because it was just too much to learn. But that's enough about minis. Let's look at, say, another simple system. Emotes. Well, not only can you put up a whole panel to see your emotes, click them, macro or bind them however you like, but you'll regularly unlock new emotes. Guild Wars 2 has very rarely given you new emotes through content. In fact, it was one of the big initiatives of the Ice Brood Saga. And the emotes themselves are really well made. Like, if you do slash sit vaguely near a chair or something in Final Fantasy XIV, your character will actually properly sit on the chair without any clunky extra layer. In Guild Wars, you have to walk over to it, mouse over it, make sure that it's the right kind of thing, press F, then you'll actually go into a whole other mode where you slowly sit down. Sitting in chair is only specifically enabled on certain flagged seats in a few places around the main city hubs of the game. Final Fantasy, you can do that anywhere. Or you can slash sleep near a bed and your character will properly lay on the bed with their head on the pillow, not clipping into the pillow. And from there, you can use other emotes to change stance, like actually control whether your character is sleeping on their back or on their left or on their right side. It just goes on and on and I can't state this enough. I remember unlocking the squadrons feature in FF14, which I could have easily missed to find Find a whole like sub room that I didn't know was available in the main city with a huge amount of custom UI. There was a training system and a recruitment system and the ability did to dispatch my group to different types of missions. I was told when I leveled them up high enough I could use them like Guild Wars 1 heroes to actually participate in dungeons with me. Like there was a whole hero system like Guild Wars 1 advertised itself on just hidden within Final Fantasy XIV that I didn't even know was there. I'm told that another thing called Trusts will come back in the latest expansion where I can do a similar thing but with main story characters, I just haven't quite got there yet. In Guild Wars, inventory management is kind of done through finding bags, which can be sort of fun and have different behaviours. Quite often, let's face it, it comes down to gem store purchases to expand character inventories or get more bank slots or get deeper material storage. In Final Fantasy, it's this retainer system where you can work with NPC allies who will hold items for you or sell them at market. Except they're not just random NPCs, you're going to be thrown into full character creator to decide who it is that's working with you. You can change their equipment and assign them personalities for an item storage system. Guild Wars 2 has vistas as a part of its open world. There's a similar thing in Final Fantasy 14 called the sightseeing log. They're basically vistas without the little fly through cutscene. In exchange, this game's Vista system gives you lore both before and after you collect the thing, and collecting them can be based on weather and time of day. Guild Wars 2 has a mentor system, it's a little toggle on Apple icon. Final Fantasy XIV's mentor system hooks into player commendations and gives mounts as rewards, and has different versions of mentors, and dedicated chat channels to boot. Did I mention the housing system? Fully customizable apartments and mansions. And the fact there's like an airship base and a submarine dock. I think you can send them out on missions because why wouldn't that be there? I'll stop myself at this point. But as I think you can clearly see, 
FF14 really does go very hard on all those side features and implements them very well. I've been astonished. I think the time has come to talk about the gem store. I mean, we mentioned it several times just a minute ago. Well, let's be blunt about this. FF doesn't push its store on you. I didn't even know that it had a store, really. I mean, I kind of did, but I didn't know how to get to it in-game or where it existed. Turns out, it's more of a website completely outside of the client. I've never been pushed to it, and I've never thought about it. This has had an incredible effect on my view of rewards and things I want to do in the game. In that, everything I see people have and running around with feels real. It feels more like those classic MMOs I played back during the mid-2000s, where people having exciting looking things made me feel like there was a real adventure I could actually go out and do. Of course, that's not exclusively the case. There is a good deal of fashion and extra accessories people have bought on their store. But compared to Guild Wars 2, that experience is much rarer here. Like, the other day I saw someone with a Malboro mount. I love Malboros in Final Fantasy games, and I heard that to get it, I had to go on this crazy adventure with a party filled with blue mages, kind of a special subclass that they added, and I'd have to do a bunch of really specific things to get it. Another high level man I saw someone had got from high level ocean fishing or something, which is also now a long term ambition of mine. In Guild Wars, when it comes to mount skins, there's basically only one place you'll ever see them from, and that's the gem store. Same with outfits, same with a lot of the best looking weapons, same with a lot of the best looking armor. Now I do want to take a second to note I'm a bit uneasy about this part of the review. I actually think it's kind of gross that Final Fantasy has a store at all, when this is a subscription fee game. It's like I feel icky crediting FF14 for this whatsoever, but I appreciate my mentality on that stuff is maybe a bit more old school. People don't share it anymore. A lot of MMOs double dip with their monetization schemes, so why shouldn't FF14 too, I guess? At the end of the day, I want to focus mostly here on my user experience, and that is that when I'm playing Guild Wars, I see the gem store everywhere. In Final Fantasy, I don't see the influence of the Mog Station much at all. Tangential to this is something that happened with the visual noise in Guild Wars 2 through its gem store as well. See, having no sub fee, being focused so much on incentivizing sales through its store, Guild Wars has put a lot of effort and energy into having really flashy looking mounts, really flashy looking armors, really flashy looking weapons. And at this point, the game has really crazy visual style when it comes to character and player fashion. Basically, everything's crazy shiny. Final Fantasy has been very clever in this regard. They do have not so shiny stuff, but not only is it from actually playing content, and usually quite difficult content, it's nearly always on the weapons alone. Armors and chocobo bardings and so on play it much closer to the chest. They've struck a good balance that makes the game feel generally immersive and worthwhile to mess around with skins in, as opposed to Guild Wars, where basically we're in an arms race of how bright and how big you can get to stand out in a crowd, and don't worry because the latest edition of stuff from the gem store is just that extra bit shinier to keep your attention. It's actually really sad for me, knowing that one of the big things people loved about Guild Wars 1 was how in check and realistic many of its skins were, and if that's something you enjoyed about the franchise back in the day, you're better off playing something totally different now, because they're doing it better. That brings me to the final big topic of the review, Christ I can't believe we've been talking an hour already, and that is something that on the face of it might sound a bit boring but it's interesting to me, and that's quality of life, polish, work on the UI, user experience. Now I have to say, Guild Wars 2 is amazing in this area. Sure, I'm not too into their like rusted, muddy, paint palette kind of art style they've got going on, but for usability, Guild Wars 2 is fantastic. We already touched on the die system, but think about stuff like deposit collectibles for your inventory storage, uh, sell junk, an easy button you can click at vendors, the opportunity to have invisible bags so that your items won't appear on sell lists. There are search bars, basically anywhere you'd want them. Like as I play Guild Wars, my inventory lo usually looks like a bomb site, but I can find the items I care about because they're search filters. Final Fantasy has almost no decent search filters. 
What about the wiki integration, which sure a lot of players don't know about, but is really sophisticated. Slash wiki, ping an item in, go to one of the best v video gaming wikis around. Googling for stuff in Final Fantasy XIV and using their wiki is horrendous by comparison. There is item glow on new items that you just picked up. There's mouse over that will tell you whether something's already in your bank or not, so when you double click it, it will filter to the right place. The transmutation system is incredibly easy to use and very liberal with its currencies. Final Fantasy's equivalent system, the glamour plate system, is actually pretty fiddly and annoying to me and more restrictive than what I experienced in Guild Wars. And everything feels shiny and polished. You don't just get experience in Guild Wars 2, you get XP that appears in little orbs that fly through the environment onto your user interface and fill up the bar giving you a nice little sound effect. When you level up you get an explosion of light and a knockback effect. FF14's XP bar just looks like some programmer art that they dumped in there. And what's up with FF14's weird as hell chat box, which you can't quite move or access in the options the same way as other areas of the UI, and has that ugly black background, and you can't keybind to toggle on or off. Guild Wars 2's UI is brilliant for making it easy to pick up and play. It collapses auto attack skill chains onto one button, because why am I arbitrarily pressing 1, 2, 3 when I could just be pressing 1, 1, 1. It sorts out hotbar positioning and swapping for you through the weapon swap system in intelligent and easy to understand ways. Guild Wars always looks clean. FF14, by comparison, can produce hellish nightmare of UIs that are completely unwatchable to anyone than the, except the person who set them up. I actually found FF14 supremely unfun to play for a long time because I kept getting new skills and didn't really know where I wanted to put them on hotbars or how I wanted to set up my keybinds, and that's with an MMO mouse, so I had to invest hours into really figuring out something that would work for me, which isn't ideal. But, amazingly, Final Fantasy XIV does win this category for me. Now, how is that true? It's because FF14 is more customizable. It's because as someone who likes to play the game a lot and has that time on their hands, I can actually tweak and eventually change the UI to be precisely what I want. There is near full tweaking. I can resize and reposition basically anything I want. And the options menu is more sophisticated to boot. Guild Wars has pretty good options, like, hey, there's a checkbox to mute the client if you want while you're alt-tabbed. Final Fantasy XIV allows you to decide whether you want combat music playing while you're alt-tabbed or just regular music playing or combat sounds disabled or just the sound of people's whispers come in. And I think that comparison there perfectly describes the situation for nearly any option you can imagine. FF has a lot of customizability, and that's not to speak of the add-on scene. Guild Wars 2 does have an add-on scene, but it's very small. An overall smaller player population and the devs have been more leery about opening up access on that kind of thing to the player base for a long time. FF14 has a huge add-on scene, allowing you to do an ungodly number of things. Rather than trying to list them all, I'll just give you a little story. One of the first add-ons I saw after enabling community add-ons was an add-on that allowed Final Fantasy XIV to interact with sex toys. When you realise that they have devs working on that sort of fringe thing, you know there's going to be a lot to browse through and a lot of sophisticated options for you to mess about with. Final Fantasy XIV also fully embraces and has native macro support, which opens another world of possibility. I have a macro in that game, which means when I stow and unstow my weapon, I enter and leave combat, which changes my whole UI setup to be appropriate for fighting or adventuring. And it will dynamically change my sound settings in the background so people who watch my stream footage can hear lots of ambient footstep sounds and so on but when combat actually begins the audio scape changes to not blow everyone's ears out and I was able to make that and set that up on my own through a very simple macro scripting language and setup. Once again, I don't want to suggest that I am the ultimate authority on which game is better here. If you don't want to spend all of that time investing, if you don't want to fall in love with an MMO and spend a lot of time with it, once again, Guild Wars 2 is definitely the better pick up and play experience. But if you're looking to be invested and spend that time, Final Fantasy XIV is obviously going to win in the long term.
So that's it. That's largely the review. Those are the big points for me of differentiation between the two products. Which product does which thing better. I do want to be clear how many other things there are out there that we could compare. As I mentioned at the head of the video. Like soundtracks. That's obviously going to be somewhat subjective. I think I'd give it to FF14 just for their variety here. They do a lot of genre bending during various boss fights, which can always be an interesting experience. But if you value consistency, Guild Wars 2's got a lot of tracks that go criminally underappreciated and recognized. Uh, we could talk about how FF14 has a massive roleplay scene, if you're into that, and Guild Wars has a much smaller one. We could compare the PvP systems. I actually think Guild Wars 2's Conquest is definitely better than Final Fantasy XIV's The Feast, but ultimately, no one cares about PvP and either of these MMOs, both scenes are dead, so you can ignore them. And there are countless other points of minutiae I've really tried to scrub from this review, just so it's not too tedious to listen to. If you wanted me to phrase this as a recommendation, one game or another, I think you can get a sense of that theme already. I would say that Guild Wars 2 is the game with more immediate payoff. If you don't have that much time to game, and you want big story quickly, if you want understandable systems and fun combat immediately, Guild Wars 2, from almost every angle, hits harder and faster. But, if you're looking for something more of a lifestyle, dedication experience, with lots of growing pains, then Final Fantasy XIV is a great place to be. Now, I know what some of you guys are going to be thinking right now. You want me to declare a better game. I've kind of like side skirted it by saying this should be for this person, this should be for the other. But I'm not here to pussyfoot around. So let's say, gun to my head, which game is my preference right now? It's got to be Final Fantasy XIV, man. And given my sitting bias for Guild Wars, it kind of crushes me to have that realization. I do think both games have things they can learn from one another, but I really do feel it's Guild Wars has more to learn from FF14 than the other way around. The final topic I've kind of skirted around is that of the subscription fee. Obviously, if you're treating this video as a buyer's guide and a sub fee is something you can't stomach, Guild Wars 2 is obviously the only and best experience for you. But there is something else on my mind. I think a lot of you, while listening to Final Fantasy XIV's feature depth and diversity sections, you'll be tempted to say, well, obviously that game has more because there's a sub fee. So they're getting more money and they're willing to invest that money into systems rather than the storefront. But I really don't think that's entirely true. FF14 has famously limited resources and budget within Square Enix, and we all know that by and large free-to-play microtransaction heavy games can earn very big indeed. We're all familiar with ArenaNet's ambition to work on other projects, sadly of which none got out of the door, and I think it's due to that more than anything else that Guild Wars 2 isn't able to compete in those arenas right now. But I don't think we should say Guild Wars 2 never can, just because it doesn't have a sub fee. That doesn't seem right to me. So there you have it. If you're a fan of either of these games and curious about the other, that's my take. Much of this review was based on gameplay that I've been streaming. If you're interested in seeing more FF, I'm almost done with Stormblood at this point. Uh, please check out my stream. There's a link in the description. Uh, one of the big reasons I've made this video is I'm hoping if you guys are interested, uh, we can get a bit of a community going there. I've never been much of a streamer, and I'd love to see more people in chat. So please check that out. Again, that's, that's just in the description. Oh, another thing I kind of want to do as a follow-up to this video is Final Fantasy v Guild Wars 2, but through the ages. Because I actually think it's a much more interesting comparison to say, okay, A Realm Reborn versus the core game. Like I said, I think the, like, the personal story is actually a lot better than the ARR stuff. And then to see, say, Stormblood against Path of Fire, it's really amazing to me how similar these games' developments have been and how well they match up. Hearing about all the months that Final Fantasy XIV didn't even exist because it was after the Calamity patches and the servers were down, and what Guild Wars chose to spend its time on in the meantime, for example. I think for many of these months and years, Guild Wars had been unquestionably the better game, without a shadow of a doubt. And that's a story I'd, I'd like to explore in a follow-up video, if people like this kind of stuff. And uh, if you like the idea of more versus reviews and stuff, maybe I should check out New World next. Maybe we should look at Elder Scrolls Online. As you guys know, I'm a fan of that franchise too. Uh, these are things I, I think I'd like to start exploring as the year closes down. But really, it would only happen with anyone's support. Elsewise, I guess I should just keep looking at Guild Wars. So thanks, guys. Hope you enjoy. Love to see you down in the comments some of your thoughts. Big topics that maybe I didn't touch on. I'm sure there's a big thing I forgot. Let me know, and I'll see you soon. Take care now. 
Oh, here, look, as well, on the end slate, I'll put a link to the World of Warcraft Classic versus Guild Wars 1 review I did, what, like a year ago now? It was a really fun project, kind of inspired this one. So if you guys are interested in those games, uh, see what you think.